Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. Day two in the trial of police officers accused of conspiracy surrounding the Laquan McDonald murder. Brandis Friedman has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Brandis. And Phil, special prosecutors called someone who is expected to be a key witness in the trial against three current and former Chicago police officers accused of a conspiracy to cover up for the police officer who killed Laquan McDonald back in 2014. Late this afternoon, Officer Dora Fontaine testified that former Detective David March wrote a false report, including statements that she says that she did not make from the scene to show that Officer Van Dyke was somehow injured during his encounter with McDonald. Did you observe Laquan McDonald raise his right arm toward Officer Van Dyke as if attacking Van Dyke? No. Did you make that statement to Defendant March? No. Were you ever given an opportunity to review or revise this statement before Defendant March submitted? No. And we have much more on this story on our website. 20th Ward Alderman Willie Cochran surprised a courtroom today when he rejected a plea deal with federal prosecutors, opting for a trial instead. An attorney for the 65-year-old says the deal would have required Cochran to plead guilty to one count of fraud with the possibility of not having to serve any jail time, but that his client could not agree to that. He never intended to defraud any of those constituents. The events for which the money was solicited actually occurred. We believe we'll be able to show that at trial that each and every event he solicited money for took place in the community. Prosecutors accuse Cochran of stealing at least $30,000 from a charitable fund set up to help poor constituents. His trial is set for June 3rd, where he could face all 15 counts of fraud. Chicago State University could be seeing more out-of-state students enrolling. That's because the school's board has voted to eliminate the out-of-state tuition rate for students throughout the country. The university had already extended the in-state tuition rate to students from 12 surrounding Midwestern states. Leadership says the move is an effort to attract new students and increase campus diversity. The new policy goes into effect January 7th. As for the weather tonight, a 60% chance of snow, but expect less than half an inch. Otherwise cloudy with a low around 24. Then tomorrow, mostly cloudy with a high of 34. And don't forget, you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website at WTTW.com news. You can also watch via podcast and the PBS video app. Now, Phil, back to you. Thanks, Brandis. Harsh political rhetoric is common these days, but did a state legislator take it too far? Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky is here with the latest from the Illinois General Assembly's fall veto session. And Amanda, tell us more about what a state representative said that is causing a ruckus. Well, Phil, you know, debates always get heated, and we, of course, just got done with a, an election cycle with seemingly never-ending negative ads. But critics do say that Representative Stephanie Kifowit, a Democrat from Oswego, made comments to another lawmaker that went beyond the pale. She has now apologized, and the House today took extraordinary action in response, but first take a look and listen for yourself. I would like to make him a broth of Legionella and pump it into the water system of his loved one so that they can be infected, they can be mistreated, they can sit and suffer by getting aspirin instead of being properly treated and ultimately die. Those remarks were directed at State Representative Peter Breen. He's a Republican from Lombard who actually just lost his race for re-election. And what exactly were they debating when she made that remark? They were debating legislation that would raise the cap on damages the state of Illinois would have to pay on certain court of claims cases, raising it from $100,000 to $2 million. The governor had recommended raising it to 300000 not $2 million, saying that the higher amount would put too big a burden on taxpayers. During the debate, Breen essentially echoed Rauner's stance and added that Democrats' allies, trial lawyers, would make out like bandits. And the Legionelle reference came out in what context exactly? It goes back to the same issue that dogged Governor Bruce Rauner's attempt for re-election, the outbreak of the pneumonia-like Legionnaire's disease at the state veterans' home in Quincy. 
13 veterans died. Families are suing the state for mismanaging the situation. Their sympathizers say the outdated lawsuit cap would leave them with unreasonably low payouts. Hence the bill to increase it. Legislators did reject Rauner's a mandatory veto, by the way, so the $2 million will be the new limit. Kipowet's comments distracted from all of that. Initially, she said her remarks were mischaracterized. Today, she apologized to Breen and to his family for what she called a poor choice of words. This did happen to our heroes, and my attempt to illustrate empathy for the families that were affected by this loss of their loved ones was not conveyed properly, and I apologize for that. Lost in my comments yesterday was the obligation to work together on behalf of our veterans to ensure that the situation in Quincy never, ever happens again. Kipuwet, I should add, is a Marine Corps veteran and a member of Governor-elect J.B. Pritzker's transition committee that will advise him on veterans' issues. This afternoon, Kipuwet moved to strike her distasteful remarks from the official House record. That is highly unusual. Republicans joined with Democrats to do just that. And Breen said he accepts her apology, but not without admonishment and without a call for ability. Breen says that Illinois is on a downward course headed toward mob rule. He noted that he'd received a death threat earlier this year. And he said Kifowitz remarks, he called them heinous. And he said that had they been made anywhere but the Illinois House floor, she would have been met with handcuffs instead of with applause. So Amanda, legislators are, legislators are in Springfield for the second half of the veto session. How did legislators get along with each other and uh, with the governor? Well, in a material sense anyway, they did override Rauner on a bunch of vetoes. Everything from changing the makeup of the State Board of Education to uh, creating a task force on emotional intelligence. But they could not override Rauner's veto of a bill that would raise the legal smoking age from 18 to 21. So that won't become law. Amanda, thank you. Thank you. It is a $6 billion city within a city proposal for, proposed that is for a densely populated area on the city's north side. Tomorrow night, a development company is set to unveil its latest plans for Lincoln Yards. That's a massive project that is slated to tap up to $800 million in public dollars. So why is the project getting so much pushback, including from a group of music venues that have banded together to oppose the deal? Paris Schutz has the latest. Paris. Phil, we expect that this meeting tomorrow night on the north side will be filled to the rafters with lots of people wanting more questions from this developer. Sterling Bay, now they say they're going to present a scaled back plan. Earlier, they had proposed buildings as tall as 70 stories high. They say now those buildings will be a little shorter, and this is going to be on the old Finkel Steel site between the Bucktown and Lincoln Park neighborhoods. So all residential around this area, a large skyscraper clad city doesn't seem to fit in so well. The specific boundaries are Webster and North Avenues and then the Kennedy Expressway and the Chicago River. Now the proposal also calls for a new minor league soccer stadium, multiple music venues, a new metro station, expansion of the 606 and promised green space, although not a public park, as many have been clamoring for. And Mayor Emanuel's proposed $800 million tax increment financing to help fund this project. But the area's alderman, Mike Hopkins, I'm sorry, uh, Brian Hopkins, says he hasn't seen the latest proposal from Sterling Bay, so he's not ready to sign on just yet. And he says that this very profitable private company will not walk away with any of the public's money if the project's approved. Well, I have pledged to prevent any TIF money from being used to subsidize this development. Not a dollar from this proposed TIF, if it is in fact approved, uh, will go to Sterling Bay. It will go to the public traffic build-out to, to uh, provide new bridges, to provide new roads, uh, possibly a new metro station, the 606 trail. All these are public things that no one would expect to be built with anything other than tax dollars. Paris, uh, beyond the TIF money, what is the source, the origins of some of the other pushback? Well, there was a 3D model or a picture of a 3D model that circulated on the Internet that you see right here. Look at that. It looks like it's the loop right in the middle of Lincoln Park and Bucktown. So that scared a lot of residents. So Sterling Bay, as we mentioned, scaled that back. Also, 50,000 new people are expected to come here to an already densely populated area. That could really mean a lot of snarled traffic. And a group of residents is calling for a 24 
24 acre nature preserve along the Chicago River. They say the community badly needs this public space and they plan to make their case tomorrow night as well that no project should get any red light until this public park becomes a reality. Well, it's important to have a transparent and open process, and we have yet to see that from Sterling Bay. Traffic's going to be a nightmare of congestion, um, and there's no plans for a large-scale park and to have accessibility and livability for 50,000-plus people that they're planning on putting there. And another wrinkle, as you mentioned at the top, a, a group of music venues is banding together, places like the Metro, Empty Bottle, and the Hideout, chiefly because the Hideout is an old sort of uh, nostalgic music venue there that puts on all kinds of different programming, and it would be endangered. It could be torn down to make way for this development. So Alderman Hopkins has proposed landmark status for this music venue so that Sterling Bay cannot tear it down. Also, representatives of Sterling Bay declined our invite for an interview today, but in a letter to residents, they said, quote, the project would create unprecedented economic benefits for the city, create tens of thousands of jobs, and generate tens of millions of dollars in tax revenue for public services annually. So this community meeting takes place tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. at the Park Community Church, 1001 North Crosby. Paris, some of the original buildings were slated to be 75 stories high, but uh, according to reports... Uh, Scaled down to about 50, 50 stories. But that's still... And, they've, and to, to the developer's credit, they said uh, they, they have expanded the green space that they've proposed. This is, this is a very big point of contention for those community members. Paris, thanks. Adoption advocates had spent this past month working to raise awareness about adoption as a way to grow a family. But adoptions, either through the privately or even though they may be privately arranged or international adoptions, are happening much less frequently. Brandis Friedman has the story. It was a day full of kisses, smiles, Thank you. and some tears. The day the Clark family made it official, eight-month-old Lexi had legally joined the family. Here you go, guys. Your official paper. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. So congratulations to you. Sasha Coupe and her husband, Lee Clark, adopted their son, Alex, six years ago through the cradle, an Evanston-based adoption agency. Back in April, they brought home his little sister, also through the cradle. <laughs> she and Alex get along so well. She adores him. He walks in and she just lights up and he loves to play with her and he's always speaking about how she's going to be a strong girl when she grows up and she can be anything that she wants to be. So I have a feeling these two are going to be thick as thieves. Today's court appearance is the last step in a long process to complete their family. It's literally, it's that like exhale, like <sighs> It's the last formal step and kind of like nothing can happen, so she's ours for sure. But families like this one are becoming less common. In Cook County, for example, adoption filings went from just over 2,000 in the year 2007 to under 900 as of mid-November this year a 56% decrease. That includes adoptions through both private agencies, attorneys, and through foster care. Cook County judges Maureen Kirby and LaGuena Clay Heron have been on the bench in adoption court for nine years. While they say it is the happiest court in Cook County, they've noticed the drop off. There has been a decline that we've noticed, a decline in the amount of adoptions that are being filed um, here in Cook County at least. Because of the um, borders of various countries shutting themselves off to um, this country, what do we right. say, Russia? Like Russia, for example, since we've been doing adoptions, Russia said no, American citizens can't adopt Russian-born children anymore. But it's not just Russian adoptions. The National Council of Adoption says international adoptions have steadily decreased nationwide. In Illinois alone, there were 876 in the year 2007, compared to just over 200 in the year 2017. The group says private domestic adoptions, typically infants, have steadily fallen since the mid-1970s, citing a few reasons, including a lower teen pregnancy rate, access to birth control and abortion, and less of a stigma around single parenthood. I'm not surprised that uh, adoptions are on the decline, as I think more folks are, um, you know, sort of challenged by the the cost itself. My hope is that maybe it means that there are, there are more families who are 
able to, to take care of kids on their own. This family has found a way to adopt not once, but twice. While they're hopeful that other families can do the same, even just once. No more. Our house is full. <laughs> this family is to and through. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Statistics show while adoptions from the state's foster care system have increased in Illinois, it is not enough to keep up with the number of children entering foster care. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. A new novel by New York Times bestselling author and Hyde Park resident Rose Ellen Brown is getting rave reviews. It is Brown's first ever historical novel and her first novel in nearly 18 years. It is set during the time of the Columbian Exposition and tells a story of Jewish immigrant farmers on a failing Wisconsin farm drawn to the sights, sounds, and smells of Gilded Age Chicago. The book is called The, the Lake on Fire, and joining us now is author Rosellen Brown. And aside from writing multiple novels, essays, and poetry, Brown also teaches writing as an adjunct professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And Rosellen Brown, welcome to Chicago Tonight. First of all, it's congratulations on these reviews. Uh, but one of the things that we just mentioned is it's your first novel in almost 18 years. Why the gap? I, uh, I kind of lost faith in this novel from time to time. I showed it, I've never showed my work to anybody besides my husband, but in this case, maybe it was a mistake. I showed it to a few people. One of them was my agent. This was a, an earlier version, granted. And she just said, oh, this, I can't send this to your editor. It'll just depress him. Thinking about it now, maybe it's because the first pages are depressing on that farm, but I think she didn't like it. And so I put it away and then I took it out and I, you know, and finally I showed it to the right friend who said, oh, I think this book has a lot of promise. Made a couple of suggestions. I went back and revised it one more time. I was doing other things in the meantime. I wasn't sitting there and, you know, moping. I was publishing, <laughs> you know, short stories and essays and things like that. Um, but finally, when I did get down to it, um, seems to have worked. And the reaction to it has been overwhelmingly positive. You haven't gotten a single negative review. What is your... No, been one person actually said, well, she doesn't have Saul Bellow's wit, but I never aspired to have Saul Bellow's <laughs> wit, so that didn't bother me. <laughs> I don't know really what it is about this that has caught people's attention, whether it is the exposition, which of course has been fascinating to everybody, especially Chicagoans, uh, for understandable reasons. It seems to me everyone has a great-great-grandmother who came to the fair and they have a little silver souvenir spoon or something like that. Someone told me the other day that eBay is cluttered with items from the Columbian Exposition. I'm very grateful for er to Eric Larson for having written The Devil in the White City, which I actually reviewed for the Chicago Tribune many years ago because the editor, literary editor, Liz Taylor knew that I was working on this book, so it goes way, way, way back. The, the family that you focus on involving were the, the protagonist, Chaya, and her brother, they Asher. Well. <laughs> they, were, they were Ukrainian, right. Jewish-Ukrainian immigrants right. that came to Wisconsin and started uh, and were placed in a farm. Right. Uh, tell us about the history yes, of that, because I'd never heard of I that. I had never heard of it either. I actually, I, I of Jewish learned. families, Jewish immigrants being put on farms. Right, exactly. And well, there were some chicken farmers in New Jersey, but that was a sort of a separate set. Basically, what happened was that a number of philanthropists decided that it was eno an ennobling thing for some of the poor people in cities to become farmers. They could have dirt on their hands and under their nails, and that that would really be much, much better than living in the in the big cities uh, of Russia and the Ukraine. And so I, I think there were something like 27 of these, these very, very isolated farms that were begun. Every single one of them failed. There were spectacular failures. You know, someone, no one had really thought ahead. Um, one of them in Louisiana, uh, didn't, they didn't realize that the Mississippi would flood every year and that there was malaria and yellow fever and it was just wiped out. And one after another, you know, in high school I remember reading Giants in the Earth and Maya Antonia and you, you heard about all of the things that overwhelmed the farmers who knew something about farming, presumably. Here were people who had no, no English, no money or very little money, no expertise, no one had ever stood behind a plow and they were suddenly, you know, in places like Wisconsin or Michigan or, or the Dakotas of all places, and they had to endure 
unendurable difficulties, and so one by one they failed. But the reason that my character, Chaya, leaves her farm and her little brilliant little brother kind of stows away with her, not really, it was not really the allure of Chicago, it was because her mother wanted to marry her off to a grotesque young man. <laughs> <laughs> and so she gets on the that train. That will drive anyone to Chicago. She gets on the train and comes to Chicago, and um, I was thinking some, the, one of the reasons that I set this in Wisconsin was I was thinking of Sister Carrie. I don't know if that's a book you ever read. Many people By, uh, read it in high school, Theodore right. Dreiser. And he had a young girl get on the train and come to Chicago. But she was coming for the allure of Chicago. She wasn't running away from anything. Without giving away too much, <laughs> just tell us briefly about what uh, Chaya and her uh, remarkable younger brother, Asher, go through when they come to Chicago. Right. Well, of course, they're incredibly poor. They have no idea where they're going, really. They arrive, and um, before they leave the station, and this is interesting because Sister Carrie uh, meets a traveling salesman when she's on the train to Chicago. My character... Um, is um, comes upon or is come upon by a young man who helps her with her luggage and helps her go over to Maxwell Street and find a place to live. Uh, and he turns out to be a suitor, and I guess I'll get back to that in a minute. But basically what she endures is she tries to get a job in one of the, the um, downtown stores and nobody will have anything to do with her because she looks like she's come from a farm. Um, she has an accent. And she uh, goes to work in a cigar factory. And they endure. Shades she and of her, Carmen. She, <laughs> Shades of Carmen, right. She and her brother endure a great deal of, of uh, extraordinary, painful poverty. You know, one morning she wakes up and finds that her lips are rimmed with frost because it's so cold in the apartment. But what happens is that the young man who helped her at, at Dearborn Station turns out to be a suitor. And he is a very wealthy man, not Jewish, uh, but he is desperately trying to be a socialist, to give up his wealth, to turn away from his family. And for me, part of this that's, that became very interesting is some, one of the reviewers said it's a Cinderella story that doesn't want to be a Cinderella story because he woos her and she thinks, I can't be a, be a, a traitor to my class by marrying this man. Um, he lives, you know, his family lives on Prairie Avenue, and I had a great deal of fun writing about that. The rich, the rich folks over there, uh, Jane Addams is in the book, and Florence Kelly, who is the woman who um, pioneered the labor laws and got children out of sweatshops, and so I've much got of your parts book, for them. So much of your book, excuse me, is, is about class and, is. and the divisions uh, uh, about class. And uh, yes, it was the Gilded Age, but the Gilded Age came at cost, child labor and that sort exactly. of thing. Uh, did you intentionally want to make this a comment on what's going on in our times? when maybe uh, Well, I didn't think of it that way, to be perfectly honest. I just wrote sort of what was the next possibility for someone in this situation. But as I wrote, I began to realize that the parallels with today's situation are so extraordinary. You know, my husband and I have been watching the American Experience series, which was on your channel um, recently, and we watched The Gilded Age just a few weeks ago for the first time, um, and discovered, of course, not really surprising, that the, the rich people of The Gilded Age were as indifferent to the poverty around them as people are today. And of course, I find it interesting to think that this was called the Gilded Age, not the Golden Age. Mm. So there was something always a little bit suspect about flaunting your wealth. And my character, Chaya, has to deal with these two worlds and try to figure out how does one manage to be a good person, doing good for other people, or at least not betraying one's class by falling in with them. And so there's a tremendous amount of parallel, I think. One of your earlier novels was made into a movie uh, starring Meryl Streep and Liam Neeson. Yes. As, as, I, as I'm making my way through your book, uh, I'm, it, it almost has a screenplay quality about it. Did you have that well, in mind? I, no, I didn't. I don't think about that kind of thing. But I did just the other day get a note from, from a producing company saying, are the rights taken yet? So we'll see. I don't think that means anything. In fact, unfortunately, my agent said, well, they ask that before they even read the book. They just <laughs> gather in everything thing that's gotten a good review. Well, <laughs> if it does come to a movie, when the movie comes out, maybe we can have you back. Oh, I would love it. <laughs> <Rosalind> <laughs> Nothing better. Brown, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. And once again, the book is called The Lake on Fire, and you can read an excerpt on our website. There is more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. <laughs> And
And that's our show for this Wednesday night, abbreviated to bring you special pledge programming. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Ahead of the 30th annual World AIDS Day, what critical work lies ahead in fighting HIV infections in Chicago? And revisiting the tragic fire at Our Lady of Angels School 60 years later. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.